Kennedy School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. In the past few months, a trio of documentary films and the feature film Zero Dark Thirty have given viewers an inside look at counterterrorism and covert warfare. The films coincide with a growing international scrutiny of drone strikes, a new type of targeted killing that's been the centerpiece of U.S. counterintelligence strategy since Barack Obama became president. The documentaries were screened at film festivals around the world, including the True False Film Fest here in Missouri. On today's program, we'll hear from the director and the writer of one of those films, as well as the video journalist for the New York Times opinion section. They spoke on a panel during the True False Film Fest. The topic is covert wars and covert agendas in film and journalism. During the Academy Awards at the end of February, a film about Israel's counterterrorism agency was a nominee for Best Documentary. Six former heads of the Shin Bet speak candidly about their participation in the policies that have shaped the long history of violence between Israelis and Palestinians. And a feature film that dramatized the U.S. operation to kill and capture Osama bin Laden, Zero Dark Thirty, was a nominee for Best Picture, Director, and Actress. The following weekend, The Gatekeepers was screened at the True False Film Fest, along with a documentary called Manhunts, which portrays the real CIA analysts who led the two-decade effort to track al-Qaeda and kill bin Laden. HBO will show Manhunt on May 1st. Here's the trailer. In 97, Osama bin Laden had declared war on the United States. So no one paid any attention. There were just warning after warning. We knew something huge was going to happen. I think women make fantastic analysts. We have patience, perseverance, people who had really deep expertise in al-Qaeda. They were women. We were trying to keep track of all the threads of various threats. And the language being used by these guys was like, oh my god, what are they going to do? This is it. This is bin Laden. This is on our shoulders. You definitely need to know your moral center. My job is to kill al-Qaeda. Either get with us or get out of our way. We're going to build from that courier network. We gained a lot of information out of him, including the name of the courier. Intelligence operations combined with special operations to create a deadly synergy. When you do this, eventually you lose one. How can you have a war on terror when terrorism is a tactic? You have a war against people. So who are the people that we're fighting the war against? Now here's what director Greg Barker had to say about the film before its premiere at Sundance. What's extraordinary is there was a small core of CIA analysts, most of them women, who called themselves the Sisterhood, who were tracking bin Laden from 93, 94 onwards. And these were the people who formed the core of the bin Laden unit that took it all the way through up until the raid on Abbott Abbott. People wanted to tell their story, the emotions of how it felt when you knew that there was this threat coming and no one was listening to you what it was like to then be blamed for that attack that you saw coming. To know that the whole country wanted Al-Qaeda dealt with, and you're the one that had to make that decision. But what do you do? What do you do when you find this Al-Qaeda guy? What do you recommend the president do? Those are emotional decisions that people had to make. What I'd like is that the audience gets a new sense of what this conflict with Al-Qaeda in the aftermath of 9-11 has actually meant to us as a nation. The moral ambiguity of the, of the fight, the role of enhanced interrogations, the role of drone strikes, we take people into a world that I think they had no idea what was really going on, and we shine a light on that for the first time. Another documentary screened at True False is called Dirty Wars. This film examines the covert operations that changed the course of the war on terrorism, night raids and drone strikes in Afghanistan, Yemen, and Somalia, and in other areas where Islamist militants are operating. During a panel discussion, director Richard Rowley and investigative journalist Jeremy Scahill talked about the film and how other professional journalists and citizen journalists are depicting covert warfare. In this first clip, director Jeremy Scahill and Rick Rowley talk about their approach in making the film. We tried to do justice to the people who let us into their lives to share their stories with us. 
because we both believe that journalists are notorious for leaving behind a trail of broken promises with people. Oh yes, I'll write to you, I'll help you with a visa, I'm gonna do it, and, and almost no one ever does it. And so it was really important to us to do justice to the people who took the risks to, to work with us. And the subject of our film is, a, is the covert wars that are increasingly, um, well now they're becoming a story, but they're also uh, increasingly becoming the new way the US wages war. Draw down in Iraq, draw down in Afghanistan, spread the drone strikes, spread the special ops night raids, spread the cruise missile attacks, and minimize you know, you, the potential for US soldier deaths. And, and that's the world that we're trying to paint in this film. It's, it's a terrifying world, but we tell the human stories of the victims uh, and, and don't tell it from an embedded perspective of the, of the military. Want to add, Rick? Um, so Jeremy laid out pretty much, <laughs> I think, most of the important points about what we're about. The, um, the, the global war on terror is, I think, the most important story of our generation. And it's a story that we know almost nothing about. Uh, it's a story that's systematically hidden from us in, uh, you know, everywhere we are. I mean, I, I mean, even if you're an embedded reporter in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, what you're allowed to see there, the part of the war that's visible to you there, is, is, uh, is just the sort of the, the, the surface of a war that's going much deeper. In Afghanistan now, uh, more Afghans are killed and captured in night raids that are conducted by, uh, by covert units, by units that don't officially exist, uh, than by the entire conventional force there combined. So, so uh, for the majority of this war, most of this war that's being fought, being fought in our name, uh, being fought in, in 100 countries around the world, uh, being fought in places that we didn't, have never heard of, uh, in places where there's no de declared war, in places where we went, like Yemen and Somalia. Uh, w there are no embedded journalists there. Uh, the commanders of those units uh, you know, are almost never allowed to speak to the press. There's basically no uh, meaningful oversight by Congress. Uh, and these wars are spiraling out of control and accelerating completely without, any, uh, without us, us having any knowledge about it. So, um, I mean, our... Uh, our film was a three-year, in the book that Jeremy wrote that it, along with the film, uh, which also might be an interesting thing to talk about, um, is, um, is an attempt to make that invisible war visible. Joining Scahill and Rowley on the panel was Jason spingarn Koff from the New York Times editorial department. He's the producer and curator of short, opinionated documentaries shown on the Times website. Here's what Jason had to say about OpDocs. The project started in 2011, featuring works by emerging filmmakers as well as well-known ones, such as Earl Morris. I joined the Times about a year and a half ago, and we launched OpDocs as the documentary op-ed um, kind of analog. And op-ed page has been very influential for more than 40 years. And I've always believed filmmakers can spark the same type of dialogue. And there's never been a real forum for filmmakers to speak to a very wide audience about things that are topical. So I guess that's how I see this, this relation, is there's been a need for filmmakers with work that has journalistic merit to speak to a very wide audience and do it in their way. Okay, so is it largely then about the voice of the filmmaker? I mean, ha, ha, what, what's being added to the New York Times by an op doc that couldn't be accomplished in, in print? In print. Well, if these guys did it, you'd see you know, someone in Somalia <laughs> riding a, on the back of a truck with a bunch of militants. Yeah. Uh, it's easy to write about that, but you know, to experience it as something else. I, I think that. Um, what we're looking for in particular is strong filmmaking. It's not just issues. And we take open submissions from the public and we also solicit work and commission work. And um, filmmakers can use their storytelling, their creativity to break through the, the, the noise of most media. I think when you talk about the media ecology and there's tons of network news out there covering these subjects. Um, but when you find a, a filmmaker who's lived that subject for quite some time, or thought about it a lot, or has such a unique vision, a unique uh, view on the world, they can capture the public imagination much more than 
you know, a, a traditional news broad broadcast. So that's that's what we're trying to do. We we could show the drones piece. Um, we can. <laughs> um, this this was the most recent op doc that we published. We we publish around one a week. This is the most recent one, and I think it shows you how a filmmaker can talk about something that is being covered elsewhere in the media, but in a very different way. OpDoc's videos cover a variety of subjects and reflect a wide range of artistic styles. Here's just one example. Drones for America by filmmaker Drew Christie is an animated satire that features a fictional former KGB agent who reflects on the potential for drone use in America. After this short clip, you'll hear Jason Spingarnkoff talk about this unusual op doc. I am very disappointed in your American city of Seattle. The police department there had gotten approval from FAA to fly unamended aerial vehicles, otherwise known as drones. As a former KGB agent, I was so proud of them. But on February 7th, Seattle's mayor crushed the drone program with his iron fist. Now, the legislators in 11 states are looking into restricting drones' use of their skies. But do not despair, a recently uncovered Confidential Justice Department memo concludes that U.S. government can use drones to kill American citizens on foreign soil if they are believed to be terrorists. That's more like it! I always thought that the part in the Fifth Amendment about not being deprived of life and liberty without due process of law was so restrictive, like a wool sweater that is two sizes too small. Especially now, at the age of missile shooting, flying robots, we would have killed for these things. That's a pretty extreme example <laughs> of, of uh, an op doc. I mean, it's pushing the boundaries of what you could call a documentary. But um, I think it, anyway, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of thematic overlap with what you guys are exploring. And I think often the issue is, or the challenge in journalism is to get the public to care about an issue. And you look for interesting ways into that. I think um, we published this piece on a Monday, and I think on Saturday there was a big front page story about domestic drones in the paper. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't coordinate that, because I'm in the editorial yeah. department. That, that was in the newsroom. But there's a sense that, you know, it's in the air. And, um, no pun intended. And, thank you. Um, and uh, you want to, you know, you want to cover it from multiple angles in a different way. So I think there's very important work to be done by, you know, hard news reporting. But um, you can spark a dialogue through something like this. And op-ed seeks to spark dialogue and OpDoc seeks the same thing. And this got several hundred comments and um, a very lively response. Filmmakers Jeremy Scahill and Rick Rowley also hope to spark dialogue and response with their film Dirty Wars. Here's a short excerpt from the movie. After that, you'll hear Scahill talk about bridging the geographic and cultural divide between Americans and the rest of the world. Later on, the film's director, Rick Rowley, also talks about some of the obstacles to making a film about covert warfare. Aden. Yemen's ancient port city was nothing like Kabul. In Afghanistan, life was defined by the war. Everything revolved around it. But in Yemen, there was no war, at least not officially. The strike seemed to have come out of the blue, and most Yemenis were going about life as usual. It was difficult to know where to start. The Yemeni government claimed responsibility for the strikes, 
saying they'd killed dozens of al-Qaeda operatives. But it was unclear who the targets really were, or who was even responsible. What I always feel is like the most important limitation that you confront, I confront, in Iraq or Afghanistan or, or anywhere is, um, is the, the massive political, geographic, and cultural gulf that separates people in America from Iraqis or Yemenis or Afghans or, or um, you know, I mean, foreign populations uh, who are on the other side of a war from them. Uh, and that breaking down that sort of gulf and allowing people to feel uh, human identification with people who they're separated from in all those different ways is, the, for me, the biggest problem and limitation of, uh, of working in a news environment. That too often, in, when you just use, just, as, just by using the language of news magazines or, or whatever, you end up turning people into, uh, into B-roll, into sort of just nature shots that you roll over an expert talking about what's going on. Um, and film, what film I believe is a medium uh, is uniquely uh, good at doing is creating feelings of identification across distance. So, I mean, even to take the most kind of um, superficial example, you know, when you go and watch a James Bond film, for a minute of an escapist moment, you you feel this sort of thrill of a vicarious identification with this super cool guy who's going around having adventures and you know, having sex with women and doing exciting things. Like that is, the, that is the, the seductiveness and the power of the medium in a commercial sense and also in a political sense. So the truly radical and I think amazing potential that film has then is the ability to make someone, an American, uh, who's never left this country feel for a minute uh, human identification with, um, with a father in, in Afghanistan whose daughter and granddaughter had been killed in a night raid, who could, you know, to make people be able to feel a relationship to that loss that is, uh, um, that is different than just the, um, the abstract kind of way that it's felt in, in like the, the form that news coverage takes. So with this film, with Dirty Wars, we, um, we were allowed by working in this medium to escape the language of news media and to try to create a narrative arc uh, that follows, that is like an arc in a, in a fiction film that follows, you know, where a story unfolds and there's a character who brings you in to these different environments and allows you to, introduces you to people who you would never be able to meet otherwise and who brings you through and changes you and drops you off at a different place at the end than you started at. Um, so that, I think, is, the, is the, the, the struggle that is the most frustrating, is, is making, the, making the other us and making the outside world relatable and on an emotional level of identification. Before we continue our program, I want to remind everyone that you can listen to this program anytime by downloading our podcasts from the website globaljournalist.org. Please send us questions or comments via Global Journalist at kbia.org, or our Facebook page. You could also follow us on Twitter at Global Jorn. That's Global, J-O-U-R-N. In this next clip from the panel discussion, Dirty Wars producer Jeremy Scahill talks about one of his favorite op-doc submissions about a Guantanamo prisoner. There was a fantastic one recently um, that was done by Laura Poitras, um, who's also working on a film that's sort of being talked about in hushes and whispers and places that has to do with WikiLeaks and secrets. But she um, she did a very, very powerful, and I don't believe it was narrated at all, yeah, from my yeah, recollection, a very powerful uh, op-doc on the return of the body of Adnan Latif, who was a prisoner at Guantanamo that um, died under very mysterious circumstances. And it was unclear if he killed himself, was he murdered, was he driven to suicide, and there were sort of, there were mysteries surrounding him, and some news had broken about him, and it was a very quick turnaround, and it was, it was an incredibly powerful short film that largely focused on, on the movement of this casket from the airport when it arrived in Yemen back to the village where he was from, and his family then going through the process of burying him, and what, it was powerful because it didn't have um, narration. I mean, it, it, it had very limited use of cards, um, to, to sort of explain to the viewer what was happening, but it's 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 a very it was a very very powerful um, piece, very powerful. One of the things, a kind of lesson to take from that piece is that 
Laura had been shooting, I think it was maybe six or seven years before, wanting to do a piece about Guantanamo det detainees and had interviewed families of a lot of Guantanamo detainees. And when Adnan Latif died, she had a hunch that she may have footage of his family and, and went through all her footage and discovered, aha, I actually have an interview with his brother and um, his uh, attorney talking to his brother. And, and it wound up foreshadowing his death. And it, it's, it speaks to the value of documentary filmmakers you know, being you know, out in the world filming, because sometimes you don't really know what you're going to capture until years later. And then we, we sent her to, uh, well, she actually got a field producer to go to Yemen and follow the casket coming home and then wove the two together. So it was hard for her at the time to predict what she would come up with, but it, it's very powerful. It's called, the, it's called Death of a Prisoner. It's about eight or nine minutes long. I mean, Rick, Rick, if you know the collateral murder video that Bradley Manning first mm -hmm. Uh, you know, first leaked, and he was, you know, he he entered his plea today, and, and it was a very sort of dramatic scene in in, the, in his court martial today, um, which you guys can read about. But um, when the collateral murder video was released, that showed these um, helicopters, U.S. helicopters, just spraying down um, these Iraqi um, civilians, including um, two journalists, one of them a Reuters cameraman, um, and killing them. Uh, you know, that video shook the world. And Rick had hap it was in Iraq at the time that that had happened, and remembered, remember something sparked his memory about that, and he went back and found the footage. And Rick had gone there on the ground and filmed the aftermath of that very strike at that time years ago. So then, when this video came out, then Rick had the other side of it, which was which he was on the ground there and had filmed in Iraq the aftermath of this massacre where these journalists and other civilians were killed by these U.S. pilots. And it ended up, that footage ended up all over the world. Um, and it was, it was because Rick had been there just shooting, you know, daily grind, shooting, shooting, shooting. And that's, you know, that often, that, that you're right. I mean, it's very powerful, a documentary, if people preserve their archives well, but yeah. The collateral murder video that Scahill just talked about reflects how journalism is changing in the digital age. Listeners may recall that the footage was released by WikiLeaks, in this last clip, Scahill talks about the future of journalism and offers tips for aspiring journalists. Largely, I believe, I believe in an old saying that when Rick and I first started working in kind of rag, ragtag journalism, you know, you, you be the media. And it's one of the things that I find very heartening about the social media landscape and also about OpDocs is that you have these platforms now where the, the emperor doesn't have clothes anymore in a lot of ways. You know, the, 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 myst, the sort of mystic version of this all-powerful media, it's, it's, it's crumbling because people realize that it's, all, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. And the bravest journalists in the world, the people that are doing the most meaningful work, no one in this country knows their names because they're, they're Arabs reporting in, in Arabic or it's a Turkish freelancer who happens to be in Syria um, you know, or, or they're, they're people that are called fixers. Um, that are in all these countries that are making the, the, the parachute journalists that come in for their 10 days to be the expert on Somalia um, can actually get around and leave the country alive. Um, and so, 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 I mean, I think part, part of, I, I don't even care about that stuff because I, after 15 or so years of doing this, I mean, I've met so many people that I think are remarkable that no one else has ever heard of that I, I, I think it's, it's, it's eventually, the whole thing is eventually going to break. It, the, the monopoly on, 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 controlling the dissemination of information has been broken. And, and how broken it is right now, I think, is yet to be determined. But, but the old models of journalism are crumbling. And, and I don't think we know yet what the, what, what's going to come next. But, but these handful of corporations that controlled it for so long, that also, in some cases, were tied to weapons manufacturers and others, their, their era is sort of you know, in question right now. And I, I, I think it's a very exciting time to be getting into journalism. It's also a very depressing time because there's not a lot of jobs out there. Um, but so it's that, it's that dual sort of thing. And the final thing I'll say just as advice, I mean, for young journalists, I, I think one of the best, you know, internships are great, but I think one of the best things, if, if you can figure out a way to do it and you don't happen to have um, children or something that keeps you locked to a particular place, is to try to find a job that is almost mindless in one sense for like a summer where you're saving money to try to go somewhere for a couple of months if what you want to do is international reporting. 
and, and save up enough money by whether it's going somewhere and picking apples or it's, or it's working in a job that doesn't drain your intellectual energy, but allows you to sort of prepare mentally to do this and give it a go. And, and, and whether it's just creating your own website, starting off with a newsletter or, or sending pitches, to me, that, that could be a far better use of time than trying to endlessly apply for, apply for internships. Because internships are, are hit or miss. But it's what I said at the beginning. It's, it's, it's what skin you want to put in the game and what kind of heart you bring to the table in it. And I think that you, at some point you have to just say, I'm going to do this. And you act as though you actually are employed. And that's what a lot of people that we all know do. They act as though they actually have a job and they go to these places. Our colleague Dave Enders has been doing that for years in Syria and elsewhere. And his video has been seen all around the world. Many people probably don't know his name, although he just won a, won a George Polk Award. He would go to these places and act like he was supposed to be there. And, and that's how a lot of journalists get started in international reporting. We'll end this week's edition of Global Journalist on that thoughtful call to action. Our program is produced by the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Our program is directed by Travis McMillan, audio by Pat Akers. Raymond Tungakar is our executive producer. Stay with us for free press watch, and please join us again next week for another Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. And now Free Press Watch, a segment on Global Journalist, where each week we bring you to a rundown of major events affecting press freedom around the world. I am Elisa Lopez. Today's news comes from Deutsche Welle, the local committee to protect journalists, the Independent and the Daily Mirror. Thousands of Kuwaitis protested outside the capital of Kuwait after a former lawmaker in the country was sentenced to five years in prison for insulting Kuwait's emir. Musalam al-Barak was also detained in October. He was suspected of undermining the authority of the head of state. The government of Kuwait is considering a law to carry a fine of $1 million for insulting the emir or a member of his family. A Sri Lankan newspaper office was attacked and burned for the second time in the month of April. There were no injuries, but the main press that publishes the Tamil language newspaper Uthayan stays unusable. The paper's owner suspects the military is responsible of both attacks. The German Constitutional Court ruled Turkish press must be granted accreditation for attending a trial in Munich. The trial involves the neo-Nazi group National Socialist Underground, guilty of murdering 10 people from 2000 to 2007. Eight of them were Turkish. The Munich court stated a new accreditation process is then needed and has postponed the trial until the 6th of May. You can find more about these and other events affecting press freedom around the world at globaljournalist.org. Thanks for joining us on Free Press Watch. I'm Elisa Lopez. <laughs>